ब्रह्म शब्द मुख्य अर्थ कहे भगवान चिद ऐश्वर्य परिपूर्ण अनुर्ध समान ब्रह्म शब्द मुख्य अर्थ कहे भगवान कहे भगवान चिद ऐश्वर्य परिपूर्ण अनुर्ध समान ब्रह्म शब्द मुख्य अर्थ कहे भगवान चिद ऐश्वर्य परिपूर्ण अनुर्ध समान समान वैष्णवीस चिदश्वर्य परिपूर्ण अनुर्ध समान ब्रह्म दी एप्सल्यूट ट्रूथ शब्दे बाय दिस वर्ड मुख्य डायरेक्ट अर्थे मीनिंग कहे सेस भगवान द सुप्रीम पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड चित ऐश्वर्य स्पिरिचुअल ऑपुलेंस परिपूर्ण फुल ऑफ अनुर्ध्व अनसरपास्ड बाय एनी वन समान नॉट इक्वल्ड बाय एनी वन ट्रांसलेशन इन परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी शिल प्रभुपाद अकॉर्डिंग टू डायरेक्ट अंडरस्टैंडिंग द एब्सल्यूट ट्रूथ इज द सुप्रीम पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड हु हैज ऑल स्पिरिचुअल ऑपुलेंसिस नो वन कैन बी इक्वल टू और ग्रेटर देन हिम दिस स्टेटमेंट बाई श्री चैतन्य महाप्रभु इज कन्फर्म कन्फर्म श्रीमद भागवतम वन टू लेवन वदंति तत्वस्तत्व यज्ञानमद ब्रह्मेति परमात्मे भगवानी शब्द थे लर्न ट्रांसेंडेंटलिस हु नो द एब्सल्यूट ट्रूथ कॉल दिस नॉन ड्यूअल सब्सटेंस ब्रह्मन परमात्मा और भगवान द एब्सल्यूट ट्रूथ इज अल्टीमेटली अंडरस्टूड एज भगवान पार्शली अंडरस्टूड एज परमात्मा एंड वेगली अंडरस्टूड एज द इम्पर्सनल ब्रह्मन भगवान और द सुप्रीम पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड इज ऑपुलेंट इन ऑल एक्सलेंस नो वन कैन बी इक्वल टू और ग्रेटर देन हिम This is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 7:7, where the Lord says, "Mattaha paratram naanya kinchid asti dhananjaya." O conqueror of wealth, Arjuna, there is no truth superior to me. There are many other verses which prove that the absolute truth in the ultimate sense is understood to be the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna. O magyan timirandhasya kyaana jine shala kaya. चक्षुरून मिलित तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो कृष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार शिवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो टुडे मॉर्निंग वी आर रीडिंग वन ऑफ द मोर चैलेंजिंग सेक्शन ऑफ द चैतन्य चरितामृत द चैतन्य चरितामृत is a remarkable book i'll talk about this in three broad parts so first i'll talk up the broad topic i will take about history of refuting misconceptions in our tradition that's the broad topic i'll talk and i'll talk about mayavad as a specific uh, misconception that had to be challenged So the Chaitanya Charita Amrit. Sorry, what happened? The Chaitanya Charita Amrit is sometimes called as a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Biography means it's a life story written by someone else. Autobiography is when the same person writes it. Actually, however, the Chaitanya Charita Amrit is more. a book of theology in the form of biography that means if we compare the chaitanya charitam with other biographies of chaitanya mahaprabhu chaitanya bhagwat chaitanya mang mangal actually after mahaprabhu departed 27 biographies of his were written out of which 9 are extant till now remaining are lost so now among these if you consider on one side you have cb you have chaitanya mangal then you have chaitanya charitamrit mahakavya we have chaitanya chandrodaya natak there are many books like these now those books they are on one side and chaitanya charitamrit on the other side why because these books are primarily about stories hmm. whereas chaitan charitamrit has stories but its focus the stories are there no doubt but its focus is on the philosophy in one sense if you consider a movie uh, in a movie every scene can be elaborated a lot but when the movie is shot and then editing is done at the time of editing a uh, generally one of my friends a movie director they say that for a 3 hour movie generally they do up to 300 hours of shooting and then now it's not the same shot being taken again that also happens but actually depending on what kind of movie it is it can be 6 hours it can be 10 hours it can be 15 hours it can be sometimes hundreds of hours same way if normally a book is written if generally a serious author writes a 200 page book on an average that author writes about 1000 pages and then edits out the remaining 800 pages so they are present as like invisible substance in the book so similarly so when a author is writing the author has to decide what do i want to focus on and what do i want to condense because every like in a movie every scene can be elaborated hmm? and what someone elaborates that indicates that they consider that thing significant mm. so suppose somebody makes a movie about some star say indiana jones and that the movie about indiana jones but within that indiana jones is there only for 30 minutes <laughs> and the somebody else's main feature then people say this is not actually an indiana jones movie then maybe maybe the franchise wants to retire indiana jones and bring some new character that's why they are doing that but the point is what is given maximum space and time reveals what is the priority of the producers so similarly in chaitanya charitamrit the way it is done is the past times relatively speaking are told but they are told in brief and wherever there are philosophical discussions they are told elaborately so if you consider the post uh, chaitanya mahaprabhu legacy after chaitanya mahaprabhu departed his legacy was there in three main places in vrindavan 
in Bengal and in Orissa. Orissa. So now there's a striking difference. In Bengal, most of the books that were written after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's departure, they were in Bengali and they were his life stories, his pastimes. Most of the books that this is, for example, Murari Gupta wrote the he wrote the Karcha. Then we have we have uh, Krishna Chaitanya Charitamrita Mahakavya written by Kavi Karunapur and others. Most of them were biographies in Bengali. Now here in Vrindavan, most of the literature that was produced was in Sanskrit, and this was about philosophy or theology. Now within the Western tradition, philosophy and theology are very strongly differentiated. In India, they are not such a strong differentiation because philosophy is supposed to be based more on logic and theology is supposed to be more on revelation, on scripture. But both were combined in the Vedic tradition. So anyway, there was a disconnect in one, or so not a disconnect, but a difference between the two of them. That the kind of books that were written in Bengal and the kind of memories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that were carried forward. So there had to be a Sangam between the two, a joining of the two and that was done by Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami is born and brought in Bengal, he heard the stories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu since his childhood and then he went to Vrindavan, Radha Nityan Prabhu sent him to Vrindavan and then when he went to Vrindavan he was trained in the philosophy by the Goswamis and then then when he wrote Chaitanya Charitamrit that was brought back by the first Sankirtan party the first traveling Sankirtan party was Shaman Pandit Srinivas Acharya and Rasik Narutan Das Thakur so they brought one of the key books that they brought back was Chaitanya Charitamrit so Chaitanya Charitamrit is it is actually, in one sense, it is a combination of biography and philosophy. Hmm? And if you see, the emphasis of Chaitanya Charitamrit is relatively speaking on philosophy. Hmm? Whenever there are philosophical discussions, the longest chapters are there. <laughs> the, for example, if you study the Ramananda Rai conversation, it's, it's an astronomically long chapter. Just go. <laughs> just goes on and on and on and on. So, like that, the longer chapters are philosophy. So, here, his focus is on philosophy, in general. And what Chaitanya Charitamrita is doing, is that the first, no, the first canto, or not the first canto, the Adi, Adi part, it has how many chapters, anyone knows? 17 chapters. Hmm? The Madhya has 25 chapters. And the Antya has 20 chapters. Hmm? Is it 17 or is it 19? Let me see, it is 64 chapters actually, so it's 19. Hmm? If I'm not mistaken. So, anyway, but the point is that the Madhya is the longest. And here, in the first chapters up till 7, what is happening is the philosophy is being established. Then after that, till the chapter 13, more or less, the genealogy will be established. Philosophy means, who are, what are the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Then, after that, who are the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? What are the lineages that are coming from him? And then after that, his life story starts. So actually, the life, this is the 13th chapter, the Leela begins. So right now, we are in the philosophical section. So normally, whenever a book is to be written, there are books written about how to write the first sentence of a book. Because the first sentence is meant to hook the reader. And that will make them read the second sentence, the third sentence, the fourth sentence. But in one sense, Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami's purpose is different. You could say the pastimes are very sweet, but he starts the book with philosophy. And philosophy can seem quite demanding. And many times devotees start Chaitanya Charitamrut and they restart Chaitanya Charitamrut. <laughs> and they restart again, they re-re-restart. Because they just can't get through the first few chapters. 
and some of devotees okay just skip the first few chapter let's go to the past time street <laughs> so the, the the reason is that krishna skaraj goswami wanted to create the philosophical foundation what are chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings and how do we understand those teachings? what is his position what are his teachings that is making it clear and that's why this particular past time of prakashan and saraswati this was like the defining interaction mahaprabhu had many many important interactions with many people mm-hmm. he had five great conversations which the prabhupad published as his book teachings of lord chaitanya so do you know which were the five great conversations sorry yes rupa goswami okay sanatan goswami then ramanand rai yes ramanand ramanand rai then sarva mottacharya and then prakashananda saraswati so these were the five great conversations and shri prabhupad himself and uh, knew the mood of ji krishna kar swami that's why when prabhupad was not sure whether he would live long enough or he would have time to actually complete the entire chaitanya charitamrut he first focused on giving what was the essence of chaitanya charitamrut the philosophical teachings there's a conversation where prabhupad says that several uh, several people have told me that i should translate the chaitanya bhagavat but he said no i'm going to translate the chaitanya charitamrut because that is going to create the philosophical foundation so it was important now in one sense among these the first three are to devotees so it's not so much outreach as you can call it in reach in reach means he's taking people deeper and deeper into the truths of bhakti ni dwarka dish bhagwan ki now in one sense sarvam bhattacharya also he became an insider he became a follower of chaitanya mahaprabhu a important associate of chaitanya mahaprabhu he be- and jagannath puri became mahaprabhu's base but the most challenging victory in one sense was in varanasi shila prabhupad says that varanasi is the vrindavan of the mayavadis <laughs> <laughs> that means it is their headquarters it is their capital like say india and pakistan have a huge rivalry now currently india and pakistan are not playing cricket with each other but suppose india goes to pakistan and in karachi or islamabad india defeats pakistan now that is a big victory you know to win on the home territory is easy to win in the opposite side territory is difficult so mahaprabhu went to varanasi and there when he talked with prakashanand saraswati then prakashanand saraswati came to know what is prakash what is anand and what is saraswati <laughs> <laughs> so he became truly enlightened about the ultimate conclusions of the vedan vedic scriptures so it was a stupendous victory and that is why this particular incident the conversation with prakashan saraswati it comes twice in the chaitanya charitamrita it comes in adi 7 and then it comes in madhya 25 hmm. so here it is coming up philosophically and there it will come up chronologically chronologically means linearly the the life incidents of mahaprabhu are being described and there from that linear perspective that past time is told when mahaprabhu visits north india and visits varanasi actually he goes twice first he goes to varanasi then he goes to vrindavan from down he comes back to varanasi and that time he meets and he transforms prakashan saraswati but it is being described first over here so that his mahaprabhu's core teaching and his core achievement will be established over here so in general when a book is written at the start of the book you can either have the most appealing content you know that is suppose if a novel is there you start the novel in the middle of the action and then people are drawn in but the other way 
is to establish authority. Mm. Like somebody is giving a class, they might start with a very enter with a with a joke or with a en very entertaining point, or they can start by quoting a lot of verses. And what I am speaking is not just speculative. This is authorized. This is authentic. So Chaitanya Charitamrit has takes that approach, and the the authority of Mahaprabhu's teachings is being established over here. How glorious it was! Not just how much based in scripture it was, but how impactful it was. So here Mahaprabhu is having. So this is the first part of the session, where I explain the significance of the particular chapter that we are discussing. Why is this there in the Chaitanya Charitamrit, and what is happening here? Now, specifically in this verse, the topic of discussion is the understanding of the Vedanta Sutra. And Vedanta Sutra begins with what verse? Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Now, Brahma Jigyasa. Now, generally, we translate it as Brahma means inquire about spirituality. and that is true and i'll come to that a little later but what does brahma mean brahma at one level means the ultimate reality but what does that ultimate reality mean so mahaprabhu is establishing over here through reasoning that brahma means bhagwan hmm? that brahma is not the impersonal brahman effulgence brahma actually ultimately refers to bhagwan it is the personality of god head so mahaprabhu is establishing the personal uh, the ultimate ultimacy of the personal dimension of the ultimate reality so it is not that we reject the impersonal it's very important we accept the impersonal also mm? but we say that there is more to the absolute truth than the impersonal mm? so let's try to understand this chid aishwarya paripurna that paripurna it is filled with energy so let's try to understand this what it means see there is one absolute truth hmm? there is the param satya vadant tatva vidas prabhupad quotes in the purport over here gyanam advayam so this is the advaya gyana tatva this is the ultimate reality now this ultimate reality uh okay this is what i'm going to speak is going to be a little complicated so those of you who don't like complicated th things feel free to go to sleep <laughs> when something interesting comes i will tell you hmm? <laughs> okay so um, i'll try to make the complicated interesting but it is still going to be complicated hmm? Okay, I'll make it interesting first. Then I'll make it complicated. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's start with something interesting. Consider a gulab jamun. <laughs> okay, now suppose say we are sitting over here and behind there is the kitchen, and then when we perceive the gulab jamun, so let's talk about perception of gulab jamun. so what happens is the first thing we we'll perceive is the smell the fragrance hey something is coming over here this 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 it smells so nice and then we are we are curious and then we get up and we go toward the kitchen and then what do we see is the sight hey this looks such attractive juicy spherical balls so nice and then we pick it up we task was is offered and then we take one and then taste when there is taste ah oh, it is samadhi <laughs> <laughs> so now now when we are experiencing the taste at that time we are also experiencing the smell and the sight but the taste is such an overwhelming experience that the smell and sight they don't really matter that much hmm? so it is the same gulab jamun being perceived to different degrees of completeness hmm? so now 
Suppose, now we understand the same gulab jamun. But suppose there would be some person who has only smelled gulab jamun. Maybe somebody is in a prison and next to the prison is a kitchen. <laughs> and they constantly get the smell of the gulab jamun. But they have not got anything more than the smell. Hmm? So, let's say that they don't know what it is. They only have the smell and they come up with a name for it. So, let's call it. So, only smell, they call it a gulab. Hmm? Hmm? So, now this is a name that they have given. Now, suppose somebody else, uh, they are not in jail but they are very poor and there is a very expensive sweet shop and they pass by the sweet shop and from the window they see the gulab jamun. Hmm? Maybe the smell is coming out, the taste is all, the, the smell is coming out and the sight is also there. But they just don't have the money to ever taste it. So then they are experiencing the smell and the sight. And say for this, they give it a name, Jamu. Hmm? So now, somebody else, they go inside the shop, they see this, they experience the smell, they experience the sight, and they experience the taste. And this they call as Gulab Jamu. Now, so the, the Gulla, the Jamu, and the Gulab Jamu. They are achintya bheda bhed. <laughs> they are simultaneously one and different. So it is, if you consider from one perspective, it is just one object. Hmm? There is only one object over there. Hmm? But, but not only is the experience different for three different people, say if you are three people, not only is their experience different, but based on their experience, they have come up with different names for it. Hmm? So the first person is experiencing, so they just they are just experiencing one thing, they call it Gulab. The second person experiences it, they experience it something more, the same object. So this is an important point to understand. So this is from the point of the object that is a bhed. It's there's no difference, it's one object only. But from the per objective, from, from the perspective of the person, there is bhed. There is difference. So similarly, with respect to the perception of the ultimate reality, hmm, there is gradual increase in the perception of the ultimate reality. So, when the ultimate reality is to be perceived, at that time, the first perception is the perception of Sat. Sat means eternal existence or we could say eternity. The idea is when a person is functioning in this world, at that time they start thinking. Everything is changing over here. The house in which I stay, that can be demolished, the roads can be changed, the cities can be changed. If you look at the history of the world, no, entire civilizations have disappeared. Archaeological evidence has found that uh, many people thought the Saraswati River was a myth. There is no such thing as a river. But now we have found that there is an extraordinarily broad river that ran under the desert of Rajasthan. So, the, the, what was actually a flourishing civilization has now become a desert. So, everything can change in the world. So the person starts thinking, is there something that is unchanging? Then that person perceives that matter is constantly changing. There is something beyond that, that is unchanging. And that unchanging thing is, is spirit. So this level of realization mm, is a realization of the ultimate reality. But that ultimate reality is pursued only as an unchanging existence. Then as that person moves closer to that ultimate reality, then that person also pursues the chit aspect. That, that it is not just existing over there, but that 
ultimate existence is also conscious and that is conscious and is perceiving this existence is overseeing this existence is guiding us in this existence so uh, jiv goswami explains in sandarbhas that this level of realization perceiving the ultimate reality only to be sat that is the brahman or the brahma jyoti level of realization hmm? so here he says this is the ultimate truth without any energies see energy is dynamic energy is what brings about change but here the idea is beyond all change there is unchanging existence so it's brahman it's you can call it ultimate reality without any energies so beyond that there is the chit aspect here this is the paramatma level of realization and the paramatma level of realization it is the ultimate reality with material energies what do you mean by material energies that that paramatma is himself completely unchanging but that paramatma oversees and guides the changes of this world upadrashta anumanta cha brahmayan sarvabhutani i am guiding the wanderings of living beings so this is a higher level of realization that the level is understanding that the the paramatma is also conscious has material energies and is functioning at the brahman level the idea is this material world is just maya and we have to get out of maya and go to brahman this is maya but with at the paramatma level you understand this is maya but this is not simply maya this is maya that is governed by paramatma so now when you go further understand that that ultimate reality also has the aspect of ananda now ananda means the idea here is ultimate reality with spiritual energies see the paramatma is more like a judge now when a judge is sitting on the high seat in the court the judge is grave for that job itself a certain amount of gravitas is required a judge is not joking and dancing and singing and feasting isn't it judge is grave like that the paramatma is sakshi is grave but there is another aspect of the ultimate reality which is the ultimate reality is having spiritual energies that means the judge has a life has a personal life beyond being a judge like god is paramatma in the office but god also has a life at home and that is the life of bhagwan so this is where the leela becomes the ultimate reality this is where leela is when the bhagwan at the spiritual level reciprocates love with his devotees so in one sense brahman paramatma and bhagwan they are perceptions of the same ultimate reality just like the gulla jamu and gulab jamun they are perceptions of the same object but there are different degrees of realization of that object hmm? so uh, is brahman parmatma and bhagwan one and the same yes they are one and the same but they are also different they are one in terms of the objective reality but they are different in terms of subjective realization so if we consider the ultimate reality it is the ultimate reality in one sense is three tier you know it is the realization of brahman the like parmatma and bhagwan so it is three tier reality but if you consider from the perspective of only objective reality then there is complete a b it's just one object but now if you consider in terms of subjective realization what is the understanding of the person seeking there is bhed 
and therefore the balance is bhed abhed and how exactly that manifests that is said to be achintya so now the point is that the ultimate reality is is both personal and impersonal so at the level of when the ultimate reality is being pursued so we could say from here when a person is perceiving only the chit sorry only the sat aspect at that time this perception is largely impersonal hmm? there is only some existence beyond this that's all when the sat plus chit aspects are being perceived and this realization prabhu pad at one place this is semi personal it's not impersonal but it's not entirely personal also it like you may work with a judge for a long time but how much do you know about the personality of the judge the judge is very official and formal over there it's only when we meet that judge in a informal setting in the non official role then we come to know about the personality more hmm? and then when there is sat chit and ananda this realization is the personal realization so from one sense this is the same object being realized but it is it is perceived differently so <clears throat> at different times across the history of the vedic tradition the ultimate truth it has been understood differently explained differently so so this was the second part to understand clearly that there is one absolute truth there is one absolute truth so now let's look at i'll talk about four historical phases in how things were emphasized and what it means for us today let's see how much we can cover let's look at if you consider the timeline i will talk about shankaracharya hmm? shankaracharya and the subsequent times then i will talk about the gaudi uh, not ramanacharya i'll talk about the times of mahaprabhu and his followers hmm? then i will talk about the times of bhakti siddhanta and shila prabhupada hmm? and then finally i'll talk about today hmm? and we'll see how the understanding that needs to be emphasized has varied now at the time of shankaracharya if you consider prime if you consider the history of india from the 5th century bc to around 5th century ad actually across the history of the world if you see this is called the classical period in greek there was a classical period the christianity came christianity actually was influential in the west after the 4th 5th 4th century constantine adopted it but at that time uh, in this classical period in the maximum books propagating atheism were written in india in the sanskrit language so india was the world champion of atheism at that time now how is that because at this time jainism and buddhism were ruling large parts of india the ruling means that most of the kings at these times had adopted jainism and buddhism Ash ashoka was there and many other kings like that so at this point these two schools of thought are clearly non vedic hmm? so in the indian tradition in indian philosophy there are two broad called schools of philosophy they are called as orthodox and heterodox so orthodox means those which accept the authority of the vedas these are also called as astic 
So Astik is defined differently in the Vedic tradition. It is not belief in God, but it is belief in Vedas. And this is Nastik. So the heterodox schools of thought had become extremely influential. And when Shankaracharya came, it was an emergency situation. And so what he did was, as a matter of strategy, if you consider, see Buddhism was huge, Jainism was huge, now we could say Dharma also was huge. But Dharma was divided among so many different rituals, different interpretations, this, this. And the influence had become very weak because of that. This Buddhism was, the, it is still a large number of people in India, were of course following some kind of Vedic rituals. So I am mean, using the word dharma generally for, generally for that. Let's call it Vedic dharma more specifically. Because the word dharma was also used by Buddhists. They use the word dhamma, dhammapad. That is their book, sacred book. So what Shankaracharya did was, he said that actually all these differences that we have among each other, they are unimportant. And we should focus on unity. And he focused more on intellectual unification. And his way of intellectual unification was, so Shankaracharya, he, he tried for intellectual unification by emphasizing that aspect of reality or that aspect of the Vedic teachings which he felt would be the most unifying. And that was the Brahman aspect. He said, yeah, there can be many different gods. But ultimately, all these devtas, all the things that you worship, they are, they are manifestations of Brahman. So in his way of teaching, what happened was, Brahman is the Satya. Hmm? And what is the other part? Jagat is the Mithya. Brahma Satya, Jagan Mithya. That all the world with all its differences are just insignificant. They are illusory. They are illusion. I won't go into the difference between the two of them. But basically they didn't matter. And in this way, actually he brought a large part of India, or almost all of India, within the ambit of the Vedic Dharma. People started following the Vedas. So he achieved something very significant. If you, now, Shankaracharya was a brilliant thinker, a brilliant writer, extremely charismatic person, and of course, a very evolved saint. His legacy was extraordinary. Hmm. Now, at that particular point, see, in general, in history, see, this might seem a little technical, but I'm going to talk of one underlying principle. See, one of my friends is uh, doing his PhD in geopolitics. So one, co uh, one common principle in geopolitics is there are no permanent, nat permanent friends. There are only permanent national interests. Isn't it? So with whom you will be friends will depend on who will help you promote your national interests. If you consider the world history, when World War II was there, at one level, America was on one side and Germany was on the other side. And then Russia joined America and they fought against Germany. But after post-World War, to what happened? America and Germany came on the same side. And Russia went on the other side. Russia became Soviet Russia. So, the entire geopolitical scene changed. Mm. There's a devotee, he said that uh, his grandfather was in the intelligence in America in the Second World War. And he said, he said, after the Second World War, he, 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 they were constantly spying against Germany, trying to undermine Germany. And he said, after that, when Germany and Americans became friends, he just couldn't digest it. He said, he not only resigned from the job, he almost like, uh, he said, what did I live for? 
you know, all my life I was trying to dis- defeat and destroy Germany and now our own leaders are shaking hands with Germany. What is going on? <laughs> but the point is that national interests are important. The friends and enemies, they vary according to time, place and circumstances. Not so much friends as enemies especially. Who are our enemies, that will vary depending on time, place, circumstance. So at the time of Shankaracharya, if you consider the primary enemies, we could say for Vedic Dharma. The primary enemies at the time of Shankaracharya were Buddhism and Jainism. Hmm. Once people came back into the Vedic fold, after that, then what is the actual teaching of the Vedas? That became much more important to know. And then after that, so this was Shankaracharya was roughly around the 7th century, 6-7 hmm? centuries. Hmm? So. From the 10th century onwards, it's almost till 10th to around 17th centuries. Mm. In one sense, the battleground changed. Now it was people where within the Vedic fold, so the question was, what is the actual teaching of the Vedas? And thus, the battle became primarily between personalists, those who said that the ultimate teaching of the Vedas is personal and what are the other impersonalists so this is the battle in which is this is the this is the contours of the battle this is the boundaries in which war is happening at the time when Mahaprabhu is present and in one sense you could say uh, that the way this battle was fought was by writing commentaries on the Vedic texts. And generally, how do you prove that your understanding, your philosophy, each school of thought, how would they prove that that school of thought is conclusive? So in one sense, the Vaishnava Acharyas, now within the personalist tradition, there are also Shaivite personalist tradition, but the Shaivite personalist tradition is relatively much smaller. Shaivites generally tend to be impersonalists. The personalism, that's why, is largely associated with Vaishnavas. But it's not entirely. Mm -hmm. But the point is that the Vaishnava Acharyas took the same books that Shankaracharya had taken. Because Shankaracharya's authority had already been established. In fact, we could see in the medieval times, medieval times are roughly 10th to around 16th centuries, this period. In the medieval times, the grip of Shankaracharya on the Indian mind was, you could say, stronger than the grip that science has on the modern mind. Like as soon as you talk about the soul, the first question most people will ask, is it scientific? Is there a scientific proof for soul? Is there scientific, is there a scientific proof for the existence of God? So. If we have to establish this, to some extent, at least some level of scientific rationality has to be there in the presentation. So it was like that. So basically, the battleground territory was three books. Primarily, Vedanta Sutra. Secondarily, the Upanishads. And the third was the Bhagavad Gita. So these three were called as the Prasthanatraya. See, every war that has to be fought, now there has to be some common ground on which the war has to be fought. If two people are arguing, then they have to accept some common authority. Mm-hmm. So if you don't accept any common authority, it's like two people arguing in two different languages. I don't understand your language and you don't understand my language. I yell at you and you yell at me. Two people just be talking past each other. So there has to be some common authority. That common authority was these three books. And this, this Prasthanatra was explained in different ways by different Acharyas. And 
Ramacharya, Madhvacharya, they explain it. Mahaprabhu, in his, so the Mahaprabhu is now here debating the meaning of Badrayana Sutras or Vedanta Sutra. And he is establishing the Prakashana Saraswati how these sutras actually they can be understood much more coherently, much more properly when there is a personalist understanding. If an impersonalist understanding is taken, then there are many verses which have to be downplayed, which have to be secondary meaning has to be taken. There's a lot of uh, intellectual gymnastics needs to be done to try to screw out a particular meaning. It like this is called in academy this is called is torture in in interpretation. What does this torture in interpretation means? Like you know, if the police if some crime has happened and the, now the police want to catch the criminal or sometimes the police don't want to catch the criminal but the police want to give the up maybe the criminal is connected with some politician or some influential person and the poli politician just wants some fall guy some person take the fall then they catch that person and you committed the crime no I didn't commit the crime slap it beat him beat him you committed the crime no beat 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 you commit yeah, yeah, yeah I committed the crime <laughs> so like that Sometimes some verses are taken and every interpretation beat the verse, beat the verse, beat the verse. Yeah. Ultimate truth is Brahman. Ah, yeah, okay, ultimate truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there is, the, see the scriptures themselves, they are written in such a way that sometimes they are open to multiple readings. But even if they are open to multiple readings, still there is a coherent flow of thought within scripture. And that coherent flow of thought means that the various points that are there in the book, how do all of them come together in one unified meaning? So the various Vedantic commentators, they try to show that the scriptures are teaching their philosophical conclusions. But Ramacharya, Madhvacharya, and then after that, in our tradition, Balde Vidya Bhushan. Now, Balde Vidya Bhushan was the person who wrote commentaries on all these three, on the Prasthanatraya. And you could say it was in this war, the last salvo for the personalists was fired by Balde Vidya Bhushan. And he established the authenticity of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. So, it is at this, this phase that is going on. Now, after that, there is, there is some, some, not exactly breakage, but some diminution. Sakale neha mahata yoga nashita paranta. In the Gaudiya Sampada, till Bhaktivinoda Thakur came up. And then from there, the modern phase begins. So now in the modern phase, it starts from, Prabhupada also says that Bhaktivinoda Thakur is the founder of the modern day Krishna consciousness movement. Now here again, the territory of war the change dramatically see while all this was going on you know, these debates between Shankaracharya and Madhvacharya and uh, their followers were going on India was being conquered by Islamic rulers now it is not just one ruler you know, there were Turks who came there were Afghans who came many people came from different parts of India now they they had a lot of political domination there was some cultural destruction but Islam was never considered to be an intellectual competitor to the Vedic teachings. <laughs> hmm? this, is no dis this is no disrespect of Islam. It is just that it was not considered an intellectual competitor. It was not an intellectual threat at all. So none of the Vaishnava Acharyas had to write any books refuting Quran or refuting Islamic teachings. Because it was not an intellectual competitor at all. They wrote books refuting Buddhism, Jainism, Charvakism. So, the, it, it, the, the culture, the lifestyle was so different that the people were converted, but generally conversion was by force. It was not by intellectual persuasion. So, it is not an intellectual threat. But, as the Islamic rule went down and the British came to India, the British influence presented an intellectual threat. 
Why? Because there was the scientific rationality associated with it. So from the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur onwards, against the, again the battleground changed. So what happened was, on one side was Vedic Dharma. And the other side was Western rationality. Or at least it was supported Western science, Western technology. And what was seen was, behind all this technology is rationality. So in this battleground, basically here, many Indians, they started, they started getting enamored by Western, Western thought process. And they started getting attracted towards it. There are some, and now actually there were two things over there. There's Western rationality and along with that, there was um, Christian evangelism. Hmm? So these were two different things. It is not that when Western, it was primarily it was British over here, or you can say British or English. Now, actually in Europe, there was a war going on, not a war, a battle going on between the two of them also. That as rationality was growing, Christianity was feeling threatened in UK also. So initially, the first people who came to India, they said, first Britishers who came, we are here for business only. And they said, these Indians are very religious people, we shouldn't mess with their religion. In fact, the East India Company actually banned Christian missionaries from coming to India. Because they said that if they come, they will, they will agitate the people, and the people get agitated, then our business will be jeopardized. So at that time, many of the Christian missionaries, they would live in outside India, because in, they were quite influential in Bengal. The British rule started from Bengal. So they would camp outside India, and they would sneak into Bengal, try to do some preaching and go back. Mm -hmm. But over a period of time, especially after the, uh, the 1857, the war for independence, East India Company basically they realized that we can't, uh, the, the company can't rule, so Britain took over the rule, and the elections over there, the, the Tory party, which is more uh, religious, they won. And then they said that the purpose of the British Empire is to spread the message of Jesus. And then evangelization started happening more and more aggressively. But essentially both the Christian evangelism and the Western rationality, both of them were critiquing the Vedic Dharma. And then at this point, what happened unfortunately was that Indians themselves, they started evaluating, okay, what is rational, what is irrational within our own tradition. Now, that is not unfortunate. That is good to evaluate because rationality was there within our tradition also. But in this evaluation, what ended up happening was basically Advaita Vedanta was seen as rational and Vaishnavism was seen as irrational. Now I'll explain why that happened. But that is how it came about. Hmm? And if you see most of the intellectuals who are considered to be the, the, the founders of the pioneers of India's independence struggle, most of them, the founders of Brahma Samaj, Arya Samaj, or Ramakrishna Mission, or all of these, they, were all, they all tended to be impersonalists. The reason was that they felt that if we have to defend Dharma, if we have to now, they were not haters of the Vedic teachings. But they felt that Vedic teachings have to be defended against Western rationality. So they said that that part of the Vedic teachings, which, which could be rationally explained, they emphasized those. And the other, they said, these are not rational. So they said, these are sentimental. These are later accretions. These are later additions. The original Vedas are pure and rational. Afterward, there are many religious faiths came up, they are all irrational. Mm -hmm. So here, what happened was that, that the Advaita Vedantins, they very strongly criticized Vaishnavism. And there was reason for that. There many reasons. One of the reasons was that Vaishnavism had, and now, this, now we are talking primarily of Bengal, but 
from mm, mm, from Bengal. There were similar trends in other parts of the world, but what had happened was many of the glorifications of the holy name that Mahaprabhu had talked about, and how that one chanting of the holy name can free one from all sinful reactions. Those were taken as a justification for continuing sinful activities. So it was quite common in Bengal at that time that somebody would go to uh, the market and they would have a bead bag in one hand and they would come back carrying a fish in the other hand. So eating meat, smoking, drinking, all the while while chanting. It is all very common. Similarly, immoral activities were emphasized. Where, where not just where they were legitimized in the name of the chanting of the holy names. And there were all kinds of rituals that were going on. Many of them were superstitious. And their idea was, oh, there is one absolute truth beyond all categories of differentiation in the world. Hmm? So, that seemed to be very rational. Because the idea is, oh, you know, you have this belief and you have this ritual. What is the logic for this ritual? What is the logic for that ritual? Actually, beyond all beliefs, beyond all rituals, there is one reality. And that is the ultimate reality. So, Christians, at that time, they were trying to establish that our religion is the only one true religion. Hmm? Hmm? And they were trying to convert Indians. And they were saying, your, your religion is so irrational, it's so primitive, it's so irrelevant. So, they said that, actually, you consider that your religion, is, your religion is only one true religion, but the idea that there are different religions, that itself is an illusion. Because there is one ultimate truth, and it is that ultimate truth that you have to attain. Now, I won't go too much into the way Advaita Vedanta, technically, this was called more as a Neo Mayavad or Neo Advaita Vedanta. Now, why Neo? I'll explain that. So, see, when Christianity came to India, it was primarily Christianity had two different aspects to it, two main divisions. One was the Catholics, and the other were the Protestants. So, Britain was primarily Protestant. Portugal was Catholic. So that's why Goa still has a lot of Catholic Christians because they were old to Portugal. But most of India, those who came were Protestant Christians. The Protestants also went to America. So Protestants, many of them were proponents of what is called often as the prosperity gospel or prosperity theology. That means that our prosperity is the proof that God is pleased with us. Our prosperity is the evidence, our wealth, our power, that is the evidence that God is with us. And their reasoning was, UK is such a small country. And how could it rule the entire world unless it was blessed by God? And their idea is that anybody who does not accept Protestant Christianity, they are all going on the path of the Satan. And they are all going to go to hell. And so, at that time, when India was materially over the years because of, see, while intellectual tradition had remained in India, but the intellectual tradition of traditional India became irrelevant because nobody was concerned about what is the, what is the meaning of Vedanta Sutra. It is not what does Vedanta Sutra mean, the question is why does the Vedanta Sutra matter at all? You know, who cares for it? So many of the intellectuals, they became irrelevant. And the Christians initially, they tried to convert by, by intellectually refuting Christianity, sorry, intellectually refuting Vedic Dharma. But they found that didn't have much influence on people. Because for most people, see even when Advaita Vedanta was very prominent in India, most people, for most people, impersonalism is like a very high, rarefied kind of thing. It's not very easy to understand. Most people were still devoted, they were worshippers. So Advaita Vedanta said, yeah, you can worship till you realize that the worshipper and worshipper are one. So, so they said, yeah, they, they gave bhakti a place. But they said, some, they gave bhakti a place, but bhakti is lower, mukti is higher. Chaitanya Pat, Shankar Mat. You, you, <laughs> you follow the path of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, dancing, singing, but don't go to the Gaudiya Mat, go to the Shankar Mat. 
that means go to <laughs> jo chaitanya path the path of chaitanya mahaprabhu shankar math so that was their kind of synthesis not achintya bheda bhed it was a different kind of synthesis but the point i am making is two fold over here see the christians they did not succeed much by intellectual persuasion they tried it but indians attraction towards the, was not india's indians attraction towards vedic dharma was not primarily based on the intellect it was primarily based on the practices They're going to a temple doing kirtan doing this doing that so then the christians in general change tack and they said if your god is real then why are you so poor now of course one fact is that it was because of the british exploitation of india that india became poor <laughs> <laughs> India was one of the wealthiest country not one of the wealthiest country that's why so many aggressors came here but the point was that that indians were at that time there was a lot of poverty so we can say india was the wealthiest country but india also had a large population so in the per capita income it was not not, not having very high it was still high the point was that the british started saying that if you are blessed by god then why are you so poor and therefore the not british not so much the british specifically the the, the christians the protestants so their conversion strategy focused more on humanitarian work they focused more on three things the christian conversion they started doing through education opening schools and offering education at cheap or subsidized or in free rates hospitals and and you could say charity food charity and stuff like that you know charitable work humanitarian work and through this they started alluring people you know okay you you are sick you take this treatment and you take this treatment uh, we will give you this treatment free but you have to convert to christianity now it was not that overt sometimes it was that overt sometimes it was that that the people you just go there and say okay these christians are they are doing so much for me i should do something for them what can i do for them maybe i should convert to their religion so in some cases it was overt some cases it was more subtle but either way when this started happening at that time many of the advaita vedanta teachers the new advaita vedanta see the original advaita vad which was portrayed, portrayed by, which was uh, propagated by shankaracharya was this world is mithya we just have to go beyond this world to the other world but the neo advaita vad it also sought unification it also sought unification of india but their focus was on unification for national growth for social growth and it was in that context that many of these leaders the spiritual leaders they might be well intentioned but see, they were also not exposed to the intellectual side of vaishnavism so much mm. so because they were not exposed to intellectual side they, they saw the cultural side and cultural side did seem sentimental irrational so in that context they said that indians they spend so much money in temples worship of the temples but there are poor people who are starving and the christians go and give money to those poor people and they get converted so why do you need to spend so much money on temples you help the poor people so that's how the idea of daridra narayan came up that manav seva hi madhav seva hai that whole idea and all the statements over there you know that you know, the idea is that we have to be physically strong we have to be financially strong we have to be active in this world we have to be successful in this world so therefore you know you may quote bhagavad gita verses but if you're not physically strong aggressors will come and kill you so so therefore you play football <laughs> hmm? you become physically strong <laughs> um, the indians are starving and instead of doing some edible food you are watering tulsi Yeah. better water something else better water something you can eat see you know there is you could say like a, there is a there is a twisted logic 
there's a twisted and tragic logic to this <laughs> so uh, the people who taught this they were not fools they might have been well intentioned but the fact was they targeted vaishnavism the most vaishnavism and to some extent shaktism also but vaishnavism primarily because vaishnavism still had a lot of followers and because they were targeting vaishnavism our vaishnava acharyas also hit back so while at one level the battle was between western rationality and vedic dharma but within that big battle the battle became between vaishnavism and we could say neo mayavad so what is the difference between mayavad and neo mayavad see mayavad this was focused more on world transforming traditional mayavad focus much more on world transcending this world is mithya just go beyond it but neo mayavad was world transforming you know we have to we have to become physically strong we have to make india financially strong now those intentions are not wrong but the target of it was wrong so the target was that there is no, now there is no need to put devotional service in competition with say social service there is no need to put the two of them in competition if somebody is doing devotional service traditionally the people who would come to a temple they would give charity in the temple and the temples would give free food so it was not that devotional service was at the cost of society people who would come to temples they <clears throat> would have some spiritual experiences they would understand that there is more to life than material pursuits and then they would decrease their greed and they would give charity it was and the charity that they would give was not just to temples charity would be given for humanity and work also so this battle itself was wrongly conceived that there was no need for that battle but somehow that battle started and then that battle over the years became quite bitter so during bhaktivinoda thakur's time actually bhaktivinoda thakur what was his legal name kedarnath datta and swami vivekananda's legal name was narendra datta they were actually distant cousins but but swami vivekananda never got to actually meet bhaktivinoda thakur and hear from him bhaktivinoda thakur met at the time of bhaktivinoda thakur met ram uh, ramakrishna uh, paramahamsa and they had some quite cordial discussions but by the time of bhaktisan thakur and then shila prabhupad advaita vedanta especially in the new advaita form that had become very influential in india and that had become almost normative and that's why our vaishnav acharyas at that time had to strongly defend vaishnavism and in defending vaishnavism strongly because vaishnavism was being criticized so the counter attack was done and that counter attack was vital at one level to maintain the the value and the validity of bhakti otherwise the idea was that the way it was portrayed is bhakti is the cause of india's lack of prosperity and progress because indians are so caught in bhakti that indians don't do anything to improve themselves materially now there are Prabh prabhupada has responded to that prabhupada says if bhakti means sir bhajan karna and do nothing else he says you don't understand what is bhakti he says bhakti also has that aspect of world transforming isn't it two greatest bhaktas are arjuna and hanuman and they fought wars so the idea that for world transforming we have to reject bhakti this was a wrong polarity there is no need for that but that's how it was portrayed and that's how that battle happened so that is the history at that time now i'll just conclude I'll take a few more minutes i'll conclude today's part what is the situation today now if you see we could say broadly whatever we want to call it vedic dharma sanatan dharma hinduism whatever the word we use in today's world if you consider what are the primary threats today see one is christian conversion now i'm specifically using the word christian conversion because it's not just protestant now the catholic church has also very become very big in india now and they are also converting i was at one interfaith conference and there they said they they, they had like 35 uh, catholic priests had come 
and when I uh, they, I was supposed to talk on some topical interfaith and I saw all this was in Maharashtra they are all typical Maharashtrians and I was supposed to speak in English and none of them knew English <laughs> and they have you know so one of them says you know I am a brother next year I will become a father <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so they have this idea that if you convert if you convert something like they have different targets you convert 50 people then they will build a church for you in your village and you will be made the head of the church. If you convert uh, something like 100 people, they will take you on a tour of Europe, free. If you convert 500 people, higher than Europe is America, so they'll take you to of America. So they have their whole system. And conversion is a much, much bigger challenge today. See, for most people today, Advaita Vedanta or even the Neo Advaita Vad, that is not a major obstacle for them to come to Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is an obstacle, but it is not a major obstacle. It is, yeah, okay, I, fo I follow this teacher, I follow this teacher. You know, whether, whether the ultimate truth is personal or impersonal, that is not a very big question occupying people's minds today. Hmm? The big question is whether there is any ultimate truth at all or not. And whether the ultimate truth matters or not. So, Christian conversion is one big challenge. Then, Islamic fanaticism is also another big challenge. Hmm? So, now Islam has not always been fanatical. There has always been, there been every, no, we, we can't just see in terms of religious categories. We see in Sattva Raja Guna, Sattva Guna, Raja Guna, Tamma Guna. So, there, if you consider even now, the Islam in Indonesia is fairly moderate. In fact, I think there is, the Indonesia is going to have the national games and they have seen, they have chosen Ganesh or Hanuman or something as the Hanuman. Hanuman is the mascot. So, they, they, they say because that's a part of our cultural legacy, although the country is, uh, country is majority Islamic, but they are still proud of their legacy and they acknowledge that there is a, there is a Vedic antecedent in their legacy. So, but and it's not Islam, it's Islamic fanaticism or Islamic extremism. And then another is, there is left liberalism, you know, the extreme left is all about just uh, complete completely deconstructing religion and destroying religion. So this, uh, this idea is that Hinduism is nothing but the discriminatory caste system. And they say the caste system is still discriminatory, it's still going on and the only way to free India from the caste system is to free India from Hinduism. Because Hinduism is non-different from the caste, that is their language. Now there are a lot of misconceptions but in the academic world, left liberalism is very much a threat. So this, this is the contours of the war that we are fighting right now. So is it that for many people, now is Advaita Vedanta stumbling, stumbling block on their spiritual journey? Maybe, maybe not. For most people, if they just, they have some interest, some appreciation for Indian spirituality. And then they explore, okay, Indian spirituality, which are all the other expressions, which are the various expressions present right now. And they may come towards bhakti. So, you know, we cannot be today, we cannot get caught today in fighting the battles of yesterday. Hmm? We have to fight today the battles of today. Now, yesterday's battles may also, they were important yesterday, they may also be important today. But are they the most important battles? That depends. So, the, the Vedic tradition has been a tradition of fighting Maya in the brand that is present right now. So Maya also has different brands. Hmm? It like, say if today we tell people that, okay, you know, don't waste your time watching, uh, hearing radio. Well, you know, who hears radio now? Well, maybe a few people do. But it's more FM and people, now, okay, radio was a distraction in the past, but today it's not a distraction. Today maybe it's a smartphone, which, which actually makes people unsmart, not smart. <laughs> but we have to be fighting the battles of today. And we focus on those battles. And to the extent the battles of the past, are, what do we learn? We learn the fighting spirit. Two things, you know, we cannot be passive. We cannot just say, oh, you have your view, I have my view, and let's all go for a view. <laughs> no, 
we have to challenge misconceptions but from the past from the past what we learn is one is the fighting spirit that we have to keep fighting it is not going to be easy to share krishna bhakti there will be challenges there will be misconceptions and they will have to be fought but also we learn relevance relevance means which battles are most important to fight right now one of the reasons well india it's one of the in one sense one of the great mysteries of world history is how india was repeatedly conquered by so many invaders india had a big population and generally no invading army can come with a large force they have large force but not a very large force so one of the reasons was that indians were caught in fighting among themselves <laughs> so you know pratap rudra was a vaishnav king krishna dev rai was a vaishnav king and one of the worst battles in south indian history was between krishna dev rai and pratap rudra so similarly there are so many battles that were fought which were internecine internecine means internally only we were fighting battles that was politi- political level at the political level we got so caught in fighting internal battles that there's a bigger war that was forgotten now it's not that the internal battle was not important it is also important you know, krishna dev rai had his own brand of vaishnavism he was more of a madhva vaishnava pratap rudra was a gaudiya vaishnava which that was was a vaishnava he was he was you could say it was before he met mahaprabhu that he fought that war at that time so he was had some vaishnava inclinations he was also advaita uh, he was not exactly advaita was shri jagannath but that was the they were caught in fighting those battles you know, shivaji maharaj was a as a propagator of dharma now when shivaji maharaj was one time was arrested and taken to aurangzeb now the the commander who arrested him was actually a very uh, you could say a very great rajasthani vaishnav ruler vaishnav general so he fought and he arrested uh, shivaji maharaj and shivaji maharaj had to escape and then go back and he survived so sometimes now uh, we may get caught in small battles and forget the big battle so it's not that we just because we are choosing not to fight a battle doesn't mean that we don't have a fighting spirit it is not, but the point is which battle is the most important to fight right now so if we understand that and then we channel our energy accordingly then we can be the most effective in our outreach so shri prabhupad fought heroically the battles that he had to fight at that time shri prabhupad did not waste his not waste sorry did not spend his time writing a commentary on the vedanta sutra he could have done that but that was not the battle that was relevant at that time so neither the bhakti sanskar thakur nor did bhakti vinod thakur they fought the battles that were relevant at that time now of course even today also there may not be any unanimity about which is the most important battle and that's why different devotees may prioritize different battles but we ourselves have to use our god given intelligence talk with senior devotees and understand based on their experience and their intelligence which is the most important battle to fight at present and then we focus on fighting that battle so i'll summarize what we discussed today so i started by talking about the structure of the chaitanya charita amrit how it is philosophy plus biography with a special focus on philosophy it is the integration of the past time that were taught in the in bengal and the philosophy that was taught in vrindavan it is combined together so it is a distinctive book and this is the philosophical section within chaitanya charita amrit the cc it begins by focusing not on appeal but on authority that how what is being taught is authoritative then the second part i discussed was the understanding of the ultimate reality that i compared it with then you remember gulab jamun hmm? so how there is three level perception sat chit and ananda hmm? and how it is the same one truth so in terms of objective reality it is the same truth but in terms of subjective realization it is different that's how achintya bheda bhed so objective reality subjective realization 
and then then after that the major part of the talk was understanding the four historical phases in indian history and the battles that were fought at that time so these four phases were in shankara's time shankaracharya's times the battle was between broadly dharma vedic dharma versus buddhism and jainism hmm. and for that battle the focus was get everyone to vedic dharma and the way to do that was to emphasize the advaitic understanding which in one sense focused more on that which could bring people together then in the medieval times medieval times is from ramacharya till baldev vidyabhushan the primary battle was between personalism and impersonalism mm -hmm. so the idea is that uh, battles have to be fought but we have to fight battles against the current enemies the contemporary enemies at that time there are no like in geopolitics there are no permanent enemies there are permanent national interests so germany was the enemy of america in the second world war but post world war it became the friend then we could say the british times actually at one level the war was between vedic dharma and western rationality but within that western it was western rationality on one side and also christ okay, it was protestant christians basically protestants evangelism was also there but then within that there is a big sub battle that came up and that was between between vaishnavism and neo advaitavad because the idea was that they thought that vaishnavism is irrational and neo advaitavad is irrational and this was the time of the battle between prabhu uh, at the time when bhakti dance rakho prabhupad they were all there and now if you consider today there is definitely these battles are going on and these battles is gone but the biggest threats to dharma are much more from other forces so we didn't go into too much discussion of the forces but these are uh, we could say christian evangelism there is islamic extremism and there is left liberalism so we need to focus on fighting the battles of today from the history of the tradition we take in the fighting spirit and we be are ready to be courageous in fighting but we also take the discretion the intelligence to know which battles are important and which battles are need to be fought now so thank you very much i have to leave to catch a flight so that is my excuse because i'm afraid to answer any questions <laughs> so thank you very much granthraj shri chaitanya charitamrit ki shila prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki itai gaur premanandi